Oh, oh twins. twins. I hate hay fever. Hate fever. Uh, I, I, I really, really hate hay fever. Why is that? Because I've had a really tough time with it. So I remember this one time, right? When I was taking my driving test for the second time. I was ready to pass that bad boy. But guess what? It was a sunny day and the pollen count was high and heavy. My nose was in trouble. Very, very watery nose. So I had this big roundabout and I had to navigate around it. And as I pulled up onto it, a serious violent sneezing fit starts. And I'm talking body shaking, can't open my eyes. I can't cover my mouth because my hands are on the wheel. And I must have been a good eight sneezes. And when I sneeze, I sneeze big. You know those big, loud, shouting sneezes. For some reason, when I sneeze, I, I shout. I don't know why, but I do. Hay fever made me film my driving test. We looked at a few different studies on allergy avoidance. And as you might expect, allergy avoidance is an effective technique to help your allergies. But more importantly, what was interesting here and what would be interesting for most people to know is that when someone first realizes that they have an allergy, then it's really best to try and identify it immediately because if someone, if it, usually children, or anyone, if they're exposed to the allergy again and again and again, it can actually make the allergy worse. So it can make the reaction that you get to the allergen worse and more troublesome. So in context to something like asthma, it can actually make the uh, asthma attack worse the more you're exposed to it because your body reacts to it even worse. So what are the particular allergens that are important to know? So dust mites, you know, the live mites that can be creeping around mattresses and linen and woolen and wool different materials like that you want to be really and you want to take great care and trying to get rid of them and sometimes you actually have to throw away your mattress throw away the carpet or whatever of course pet allergies so dogs cats um, and I'm not sure if you will keep cockroaches as pets but I guess some people might maybe, maybe in America or something but um, <clears throat> uh, mice and another common allergen, which everyone's going to know, of course, pollen, pollen, and um, organic uh, mold and fungi. So, what are the tips and tricks to help get rid of these allergens? First of all, <clears throat> I'd help you avoid them. Keep the windows closed. Um, clean places where mold and fungi and these creepy crawlies might be hiding. So maybe. Um, downstairs in the kitchen cupboard or where mold in, in a particular place in the house use a HEPA filter H-E-P-A in your, in your Hoover that can help you that can help get rid of the allergen causing material and um, clean often and, and do as best you can to not let the pubic crawlies in if you think it might be your mattress then get rid of the mattress but allergy avoidance is a successful, useful technique. And the sooner the better. The sooner the better. So, the evidence about avoidance as a treatment mechanism for allergies and hay fever shows that, of course, it's effective. However, it's not that simple. Some people, the allergies are in their house. Some people, the allergies are where they work or where they go to school. But of course, it's a, an effective step and it's the first step to try. I want to avoid him, but I can't. Some things you just can't avoid. I could say the same thing. The second treatment mechanism is antihistamines. Everybody, everybody knows about antihistamines, but what's the reason that they perhaps haven't worked for you? Or how could you make them work better? What's the evidence behind it? Let's find out now. So we looked at a few different studies for antihistamines, and one of the more useful ones was the role and choice criteria of antihistamines in allergy management expert opinion by a Polish professor of allergology. So, this was particularly useful because it showed really the history of the development of the antihistamine and how they've got better. So first of all, the first generation of antihistamines, they were they had a lot of side effects, caused a lot of, they caused a lot of tiredness, confusion, mental disturbances, um, they were dopaminergic, they were muscarinic, they were adrenergic, adrenergic. So you know when people would take them, they would, they would actually have trouble passing urine and having a really dry mouth. But the newer antihistamines aren't really like that. They're more selective for the H1 receptor. There's four receptors, H1, H2, H3, H4. 
So uh, second generation, uh, since the 80s, um, been a lot more selective for the symptoms that we actually want to stop. So that's great news for us. So, you know, side effects for the newer antihistamines. So there's, there's quite a few, but they affect everyone differently. They are generally perceived of as safe. That's why you can buy them off the counter. However, not everyone responds the same. So particularly where you want to be careful is where if you're unwell anyway, or if you have uh, liver problems or heart problems to do with arrhythmia, or you're dehydrated or you have an electrolyte imbalance, that's where you want to be careful. So still watch out if it's going to make you feel tired. So it's always best to work with a doctor and speak to them and see what might be best for you. So um, the new type of antihistamine called bilistine, which actually, um, from what the research shows, that is, is very, very effective and has um, actually showed that it caused less fatigue than the placebo. So in conclusion about antihistamines, of course they work. That's what the evidence says. However, there's many different types and there's many different variables when it comes to making them work as best as possible for you. So the next type of treatment is roids, steroids, the infamous steroids. Now this is very, very interesting and a lot of people have different conflicting views on it. But what does the evidence say? This is what the evidence says. Some steroid nasal sprays are available to buy from pharmacies and shops, while other stronger ones are only available from prescription. Some examples of steroid nasal sprays include beclometazone, budesonide, fluticasone, and mimetazone. Each of them are slightly different. And the good thing about this is that if one doesn't work or if you react badly to one of them, you can just try the other one and there's four to choose from. So that's pretty good. It gives a good variety. What does the evidence say about steroid nasal sprays? We tried to look at some pretty reliable studies and they all say pretty much the same thing. Nasal steroids work. They reduce nasal symptoms of hay fever, sneezing, runny nose, and blocked nose. So if you're struggling with hay fever and runny nose and it's destroying your life, then it's definitely something to look into. You should go to your doctor and have a chat about this yourself. But what your doctor should tell you is that they take a while to start and that there could be some side effects. And the side effects include perhaps a stinging or burning sensation in the nose, dryness and crustiness in the nose, a dry and irritated throat, perhaps an unpleasant taste in the mouth, an itchiness, redness and swelling in the nose, and nosebleeds. So these might happen, and this is just a caution. I've not had any of these problems before, but some people do. But it's good because there's four different types of sprays to try, so you just need to find, with your doctor, the best one for you. Now the most important thing about taking nasal steroid sprays, and I'm sure all doctors would agree, is how you take them. The technique you use when you're spraying it up your nose. If you don't spray up your nose the right way, then it will not work. So check out the link in the description, check out the link right there, and you can look at the technique demonstrations. This intervention is the one that I've been looking forward to most to tell you. This is nasal douching. Okay, and I douching. Really, nasal douching. What does that even mean? Nasal douching. I know it has a funny name. Sounds a little bit weird, but this has changed my life. It really has when it comes Trust to. Trust you to come up with a, a, a treatment name like that. Is that what it's actually called? <laughs> okay, here's what it is, and here's how it works, and this is the evidence. So this is nasal douching. Now stick with it for a minute. I know it looks pretty weird. It looks pretty funny, but the theory is you passing salty water through one nasal passage to another clears out mucus allergens and debris and things that are causing you trouble and things that are causing your symptoms and it keeps the nasal mucosa supple and moist which is good instead of dry and crispy the journal of the college of family physicians of canada now they reviewed clinical evidence on the efficacy of saline nasal irrigation for treatment of sinonasal conditions and symptoms. The conclusion was that the nasal irrigation is a simple, inexpensive treatment that relieves the symptoms of a variety of sinus and nasal conditions. It's cheap, it works, and there's hardly any side effects because it's not actually drugs, it's just salty water and could help minimize antibiotic resistance which is great. I've had a fantastic experience with nasal douching and it started with reading this book, Cold Free Forever. Uh, so anybody that reads that book 
it's probably come to a desperate situation and would try anything to get rid of their hay fever. And that was me. So I read this book and it talked about nasal douching, about how there's many people who do it all over the world, particularly in Arabic culture, particularly in the Middle East, and how it works for them. It's almost like an old wives tale that works for hay fever and sinus congestion. So I started doing it and I did it regularly few times a day and it was working within the first week so I, I can't recommend this enough. I first read about that a few months ago and since then it's changed my life so please I, I change your life <laughs> so please have a look at it please do your own research do your own reading and that's nasal douching that's the evidence at the bottom line we're not telling you to do any of these we're, nope. just, we're just giving you information we're giving that's you it. evidence we're giving you power knowledge is power because we're not your doctor we're doctors but we're, we're not, not your doctors. doctor with the Ooh, Ooh, twins. twins. Oh, you didn't say it right. Ooh, yeah. twins. <laughs>